Hello and good evening. This is David Herman, alias Daz, D-O-Z, the artist, from Olympia, Washington in the United States. I'm going to open up one of my illustrations I'm working on. This one's called The Flight of the Cicada and the Clover Flower. Um, there's one, there's, uh, I think, two or three prior sessions. I think three. And this will be the fourth, so... Uh, you can see them on my YouTube channel under AnaQuest1618, O-N-A-Q-U-E-S-T-1618, all one word, AnaQuest1618. So this will be session four, and let me magnify my illustration a little bit. I want to work on the body of the cicada. And I'm using a reference off screen, but now I've got to kind of detail up this body and I've got to um, uh, What do you call it? I'm gonna You know change the shape of it and stuff and do whatever has to be done coloring wise and stuff to uh, create the digital cicada And at the same time if you look real close you, depending on the brushes I've used, I've tried to create the situation that I was painting artistically in the real world, analog art, uh, digitally. So that digitally I'm doing it to look like it was traditionally painted. If you printed this out on a canvas, it would have that look. Especially if it was a, some kind of textured canvas. So it would be kind of interesting. But... Uh, Let's start working on the body. So we're going to go all the way up to the top, make sure we're up there, yep. And we got a new layer. And then, um, I'm going to erase some of this body to taper it down. Just Let's see. Actually, that's pretty good. I'm going to uh, yeah, taper it in some areas. So to do that, We've got to find out where all the body is. So if I click here, pretty much it's showing it's this layer. Now, to double check that, we're going to pick on the eraser. And I'm going to erase part of the body to expose the background. If it doesn't work, I'll just redraw. But it should allow me to erase and there we see I'm erasing some of the color on the lower part of the torso and exposing it a little bit and I'm going to do some of that at the top and then we're going to click again with the arrow key and find out where the next <coughs> layers are. So if I click here, I click outside this box and I click here, I click here, there we go, way down here, see? Because uh, as I work, <coughs> I add layers. And I add layers at times where I think I'm going to want to want to have control in the future, go backwards or forward in time, erase or add or do whatever. It's called uh, non-destructive art when you do that. You use the ability of your layers um, so that you can always go backward and forward and edit. You want to be able to edit. That's the key. See, so I want to take this yellow out now too that's in there. Or add to it, so I can I can add. So I'll leave it like this. I got to find that black stroke. I'm gonna go back to the brush, click outside my art, and touch the black stroke. It's showing me it's in that layer. Then I go to my eraser, and if you watch, see the black stroke is now coming off the background. And uh, that's because I did a sketch. You know, I have a methodology. If you watch the first three videos, you'll see that I drew the background bloom, then I did a sketch, then I started to draw. 
And uh, I can go back, see, and edit all of that, like we are doing now. And they're all on different layers, and I just click outside the art and touch something, and you can find it. And that's the beauty of, <laughs> pardon me, non-destructive art. So if you want to not destroy your artwork and you want to be able to edit it, like me, that's one way to do it. And we're going to touch again. We're getting there. Click outside this box. Very much that tiny little purple is up in there. Let's see. There we go. Because I'm going to reshape the body. Now, you know, this looks like unusual lighting and stuff, but that's not the desired effect I'm after. Click outside the box. Click in there. Get my eraser. And there's still some stuff showing, so I want to get that very purple right over the yellow. And I'm going to touch right there. I'm going to turn this off for a second. Turn it back on, off, on. That's not the layer. So I'm going to touch. Um, I'm going to turn that off, and then I'm going to touch that purple. And I'm going to turn that back on. And you see where I'm at down there. And then I'll take the eraser. And lo and behold. Are we getting it? Yeah, we're getting some of it. All right. So now, let's just uh, get that yellow out of there. Dun, 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 dun. That's the yellow layer, and that's where I want to add in yellow and soften what I have there. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to take the eraser, and you can see the yellow starting to disappear in between. <laughs> and then Let's just try and draw a little bit over that. First, I want to get rid of that white bar, too. That white bar is irritating me. Let me take that little white thing out. Still there. Right now, we're still in the process of removal of stuff. Hmm, mystifying. When you click something, it's supposed to be what you click. Let's try that one. You know, it's hitting whatever pixel it hits. Okay, there goes the white. See that stripe above the wing coming out? Between the wing and the torso. And then the last is that, that purple, which I think is part of the sketch. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to hit this black just for a second right here. I'm going to try and erase the purple now on the edge. Is that it? No. All right, let's see if yellow over that will hide it. Sometimes it'll do that. We're going to go up a layer while we're here. Okay, there we are. And I'm just going to... Check that out. A little bit of white in here for a minute. So that's like canvas. Right? And we're just putting that in this, between the space of this. I'm going to clean up that edge of that wing, which was kind of disturbing to me. So now I have like canvas, right? And then if I want to Fill that in with the proper colors. I could take my eyedropper and I could tap outside the painting 
in the painting, here, there, everywhere, go up there, eyedropper, uh, touch, and then go to brush, and touch that dot up there, that's that color, and then kind of brush that in. So now I'm putting the background back in, sort of. You know, as I fill that space back up, you've watched how I'm repairing. This would be like if you had to do an edit to something you completed. You know, you got to know how to do it. you got to know how to get back into your art and not redraw it, especially something that you had 100 hours in or whatever. You know, that's probably a good... Mm, I think I'm like seven hours into this, maybe. So... I kind of just get some of this back here so we can reshape the body. And I might go a little brighter just on this edge. And then put a little bit of a, a rosy, orangey color. So like that color there, I'm going to get my eyedropper, tap it. color paintbrush tap it with the eyedropper there we go and put some of that in there as bloom so I'll just kind of go like that and then I'll add a little more different bloom now that we're blooming and just some of that there and that'll be good enough that I can you know, edit uh, later, but there's enough of a start where I can redraw the body. So we'll put that as a save. And then we'll um, redraw the body. So we'll go above that. And I'm going to pick a brush. <clears throat> I want to be in uh, gouache third brush down, which is called the gouache on canvas. Okay, then I'm going to go over to my colors and I'm going to do some line work in um, this off gray green thing so I can see. Just in the, maybe a little brighter. And just uh, kind of figure out how I want the shape of the body to go. So I'm going to kind of go like that. And then it's going to be taper to a point, almost. It's rounded here. And then we're going to come back inward. Like so. Then it comes a little wider, like so. And we'll have a ring and a second ring to the plate, like that. And these plates uh, can get, you know, covered with pollen. And then we're just going to kind of uh, shape them, uh, getting a little wider as they come closer to the viewer. Just to get this started. Okay, you want to do a save. And that's the start of the new body. Now what I'm going to do is start from the backwards of the tail and start working my way in. 
using the various colors and things I want to use to get it started. So I'm going to come out. I'm actually going to go up a layer because I like where I've, what I've got there. If I had to erase everything back to here, I'd be happy. That's how you work non-destructively. Again, just create new layers every time you're happy. So you can go back to where you were comfortably to do edits like I do. And that's what non-destructive work is. And you can see as I draw that uh, it affects the little box to the left of the word pixel in the layer. You're seeing what layer, what's being done on the layer you're working on. But they're so tiny that you got to track it down like I showed you. Either with the arrow key or by clicking each layer, you can find what's on a layer, you know, in your art. Making that connection between the art and the layer kind of important and I'm starting to draw the body in and all of it will be edited ten times over you know I'll go back and forth and shade and color and put highlights and midtones and shadows and stuff like that in but I got to start somewhere. So this is the rough. Um, you know, it's, it's just the rough kind of a painted in. So you have these different plates. You know, it's like a pill beetle or something. They're all hinged. They all probably have names. I forget what they would call it. On an insect, you can look up the parts of the cicada if you're interested. It's always good to learn those things. Like if you study animal, vegetable, mineral, which you really should practice doing all the time. I switch around from animal, vegetable, mineral just by picking a topic. If I draw a lion one day, of course I'm drawing animals. If I draw insects, I'm in the <coughs> insect world of animal, vegetable, mineral, and so on. There you go. And do a save. So, if nothing else, right now you've just seen how we did an edit to reshape a body, save the background, and do other things. And it gets more and more elaborate the more you work on it. So, uh, we're going to just, I'm going to jump all over the place when I do this. As I figure out the tones that I want. And I'm going to, as I start to build this, I'm also going to have the effect that there's pollen on the creature. <coughs> so now we're going to take the hardness off. Keep tapping this till we do it. And the flow, and then I take the uh, opacity down to in the 70s, like. I don't know. These things have a mind of their own. There we go. So now, we can have a little more coarser brush stroke. Make sure we're on the right brush. So you can see some of the canvas. And then we just start, um, you know, illustrating. Working as an artist and drawing.
And that, of course, is the fun of everything, is just to start to build the reality of the object. You know, give it credence. Make it look like what it's supposed to. And once I get some of this going here, I'm going to pause just for a second and start some music up. Do a little save there. So these wings connect to underneath this top shell that we have here. We have a shell like I'm going to bring that down just a fuzz like that so that the connections of the wings were underneath that like so and a little darker edge like that on the bottom very cool and we're going to clean up the top edge just a little bit tidy it up make a distinction and there'll be more coloring and shading of course but then we'll do a save. I'm going to take one second, go over to my laptop. I draw on the uh, desktop tower. I'm going to open up a browser and I'll select some music. Um, so I'll just put this on pause for one second. And now we have music. So just a shout out to the royalty free station I use sometimes. This is Ben Sound Music, B E N S O U N D, and they're supposed to be royalty free. So sometimes they work that way. <laughs> it all depends on what mood um, YouTube's in when I upload it, whether or not they're going to freak out on me. And, you know, 99% of the time with this station, they don't. So it'll say, you know, after it re uploads my high-res 4K video, then it goes through to see if there's any copyright infringements. And uh, if there isn't, it's a good thing. If there is, it's always a thing where you got to go in and mute the music and leave your voice and takes forever and all kinds of edit stuff which I'm not a good guy at editing so that's why I just do these without any edits. I'm going to draw a little bit of an arm up at the top too. You just saw me shade one that's floating out there and I'm going to add a little brown to this other one. It's sort of a, giving it some more realism. You know they looked flat color. Uh, that little dab that fell in there looks good. I like it. It's kind of interesting. We're going to erase a little bit of it back. Just it's too long. But There we go on the top. That's kind of cool. Do a save. And then I want to draw a little bit of an arm for the in-flight up at the top there. So I just made my own little thing again. So... What I'm going to do is draw. All right. So I'll take um, same place roughly, bend it back a little. Uh, actually, let's make the arm a separate layer. It doesn't matter how many layers you have. You could have a billion of them. It's just so that you keep your stuff separate so you can edit it. See that? So now that I have that nice acrylic or gouache on canvas brush, it's not a solid. It leaves little uh, spaces that the pigment isn't going down. It gives you the effect of canvas. And then it's a matter of just learning how to think kind of different, a little bit differently than you do when you're painting on a canvas because you're actually painting the canvas. <laughs> but you'll get it. You know what I mean? It's just one of my methods of painting digitally is to make a digital painting look like I've hand painted it and not, you know, like puppet shiny art or, you know, smooth anime art for my style. My style is more 
it can be anything, it can be realistic, it can be representational, it can be hyper-realistic, it can be abstract, it can be science fiction, it can be, you know, um, cubism, whatever. But when I do that, I want it to look like that. And to make it look like that, you got to use the right brushes. So just like when you're putting down a, a pigment on your canvas, maybe you're using chalk. Let's say you're a mix. I am a mixed media guy for sure. So if I was using chalk, I want it to look like chalk. And then what I'll do is I'll select brushes till I find one that gives me that look. Because this brush really works quite well for chalk. You make a nice brush, make nice strokes. And uh, you can simulate chalk, you know? And so that's what I want. Like as I'm adding stuff, I'm thinking well, I would do this in pencil, I would do this part in chalk, I would do this part in acrylic, I would do this in oil, I would do this in pencil, I might do this in lipstick, I might do this in ballpoint pen. I, when you're a mixed media guy, you like to use different things for the, the different effects. At least I did. And uh, so I'm going to bend this one in. This just makes it interesting, you know. Um, the parts of the arms of the insects. Insects are so bizarre, so you'll have a lot of fun the more you draw insects. Yeah, the more you draw animal, vegetable, mineral, the greater your skills will get at all this crazy stuff. You know, I'm just drawing this right out of my head at the moment. And the way that jumped, I have a button set. If I push it down on my digital pen, it simulates the hand so I can move it around without going over to the menu sometimes and do that. It's a nice feature to add. You can set your program your buttons on your pens to do things, but I always forget what I program them to <laughs> till I accidentally hit them and then I go, how did I do that? What happened? Hey, what happened? I always forget that I'm trying to help myself and I end up confusing myself. I'm an artist, and artists have the weirdest brains ever. I've been accused of, of having no steady state. So, I tell my friends to describe me. I have no steady state to them. And uh, they're right. I can keep an enormous amount of stuff in my head as an executive or something. I've had different executive positions and, you know, handle mm, so many projects simultaneously. But it all comes at a cost as you get older. You just, uh, you get resistant to some things, so you got to make yourself do them. And you got to tell yourself, do not have a negative response now that you're an old crank. <laughs> So I try, you gotta forgive me if I ever get in the crank mode or the freaked out mode. So I'm making up these arms. I know they have articulations. I just like to put in my own sometimes. It's, it's just cool, you know? It, because really it's all there. It depends how much you magnify something or whatever you're doing and so on. Keep the top a little bit vague. They all have their purposes, and, and every every part has a purpose. There's no like extraneous. This one might explain something about creation to you now that I just brought that up. In every living creature, every creature, every plant, every animal, vegetable, mineral, subatomic and atomic, there are no wasted parts. Okay? In other words, like when you take apart, say you get a, uh, an Ikea desk, you know, you put it together and you find out, oh, you didn't put those seven parts in. Well, the thing still works. 
you had some parts that help it make it even better. But it works without those parts unless there's sliders on a door or something. But you might you might have some extra screws left over that you didn't put in and so on. In nature, there's no such thing. Not to me. Every single piece has a meaning. And because we're not the creator, we don't know what those meanings are. But there's nothing that's in there that doesn't belong in there. Because it all is there by a, uh, evolution. You know, it's a design that evolved by purpose. So yes, I believe that there's design work. But how we, you know, how things are designed, I also believe is by need. So creatures trying to, you know, walk on land or reach something or needs a longer beak to get pollen, uh, it's all interconnected. And the plant, you know, gives the command that the, the beak of the hummingbird should grow over time. And it does. And they're specific to plants. So, you know, it, it modified the bird to get its pollen. And you will find nature just spectacularly mystical. The more you study, you know, like when you're doing robotics and you say, okay, uh, I want this to roll across the table. All right, so you've done it enough where you know there's some basic functions for everything. And you might need a motor, you might need a gear, you might need six or eight or ten parts to make a wheel, whatever it is. But you don't put parts in that you don't use. Each thing that you put in, you pay attention to its weight, its material, its use. You know, everything is purposeful. And so, in nature, there are no extra parts. In stuff humans do, there might be extra parts, you know, like... Anything I take apart and put it back together again, it works. And I go, well, why would it, why don't they put all these screws in the first time? <laughs> if I can get it to work without the screws the second time. So, yeah, when you when it's not as fine tuned, you know, when it's not as fine tuned, those it's better if you have the parts. But if you don't have the parts. Sometimes the thing works, it doesn't work as well. You know, like a washer that's important for something not to, a screw not to unwind itself from the nut. Uh, when you put it in the nut, it works and everything, but if you don't have a lock washer, it starts to back itself out or fall apart or something. So each part has a purpose, but in things made by man, they will work without the part sometimes. Whereas in nature, there is no extra part. So if you took the eyes out of the insect, then you can see. If you did anything to any part of that eye, it's going to affect the entire way that insect does things. And that is really, really, really bizarre truths of the cosmos. And... Um, really is mystifying, mystifying, bizarre stuff of life. So, you know, and things have separate purposes and separate, they, they're divided from each other for reasons or they're joined to other parts for reasons. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, everything has its own specific purpose, its own reason why it's there. Omitting it, if you were making the insect, <laughs> would affect the function. Everything of function comes first. Form comes next. Especially like if you're in IT, for instance, say you're um, a guy that's making a toaster. 
the engineer designs the toaster first, the motor, and the IT guy designs the skin on the toaster so it looks appealing to people to buy. You know, it might be red colored, it might have certain buttons, and so on. But each button has a function. You know, there's got to be an on and off and uh, increments, one through five, and so on. So you, you know it's got to do that. So you design the parts to be attractive that do that. And in nature, same thing. Nature is, you know, one part has something to do, one part, another part has another thing to do. And if, if they want it to be, like say for mating, if you want a bright color to go on, that's got to do what it's supposed to do. If you want to not be seen in the dark, then your skin has to um, be matte finish in the dark. And these are just some things I'm bringing up because when you're an artist, if you study f form follows function, and you're looking and drawing something, you can say, oh, that's a hinge. Oh, that's articulated that way. And then when the light shines on it, when it's at this angle, then it looks like this. And so you start to really, really understand how things fit together, and then you can make them up, like I'm making up these kind of these things, and how I want them lit. And that's just the way I'm doing it. So file save. Now we drew another cool arm there that's sort of bent and, and scratching its eye or whatever it's doing, scratching its chin or something. We'll pick another uh, music. Now these are uh, individual tracks. I'll have names, but I'm not going to name them and see if that way maybe they won't bug me because I'm trying to promote them and it's royalty free and all that. But the weird thing is, even when you do that, then somebody makes a claim. They say, well, you know, and it may not even be the Ben sound, but for sure. YouTube says, you have an infringement. You will not be getting any royalties on this. Even though you don't get music, you don't get paid. Your channel doesn't have enough viewers to get paid. Um, we just want you to know you've infringed. And then I go in and I try and follow all the advise, advise uh, options and get rid of my infringements and stuff. And, now, we're putting some pollen in here. Get back to the earth. So the things I yammer about are things artists think about. Like if you're in my studio, you might be asking me these questions. And I'm freely offering the answers I have. As I put a little dusty pollen on some parts here to uh, give the realism. And there are there's just highlights like that, you know, where the pollen is just brushed on from the plant. Uh, different things in nature, even just flying through um, a forest, you know, it's going to get pollen on itself. nice contrasty lines and stuff. Things fit together almost the way you think they would. Not quite, but almost. I really suggest studying all the, the armature and the plating and enjoying the study because really you'll become wise. You will become so smart when you study nature. It's like 
you know, if you watch a bee or something, you know, flying flower to flower, and what it does with its feet and its tail and its dance and everything, and how it's collecting it. You know, I'll sit out at my plants in the garden, and I'll just, you know, be right there with the bee, and I'll go, good morning, bee, how are you doing, bee, hi, bee. And it goes in and out of my uh, flowers, say on a, a rhododendron, which are really popular out here in the Northwest. And it goes in and out of the individual flowers, and I'm watching that, and that's how we study the parts. Besides looking at, you know, photo reference, it's really important to go out and look at life. Take your coffee in the garden, you know, carry it. You don't have to sit at your table. Carry it over, drink. Never mind what your neighbors think, you're an artist. You know, they're going to think you're loony anyways when you talk to them. Because they're just worrying about the Simpsons. <laughs> they're not. I'm participating in the creation. When I draw like this, I'm participating in life as far as I'm concerned. Like I am thinking about the mechanics of it, the beauty of it, what, how things work, how they fit together. And then it's kind of like, kind of like how is this pollen going to fall on these plates? So it kind of like gets caught on the top edge or something like this. See how it's coming down there? It's like uh, on the articulations. And that pollen, that has nothing to do with which way the light's shining. Like as far as, you know, if something's in light, it's highlighted on one edge, it's darker on the other edge. And pollen just kind of sprinkles. So you're going to have weird alignments of pollen just on the edge of something, you know. And how bright you want it to be and how much it's going to articulate the edge of something and the contrast, you know. You can dink around with that. So understand every line when you do digital art, this is another observation of mine, is you must place every single line. There's no like accident where the paint spills on the canvas and you go, oh, that's so cool, I'm keeping that in there. If you want it to look like that, you gotta put it in there yourself. A digital art is, um, each stroke is dependent on the artist, you know, every, you're not going to like bump into this with your digital brush and spill paint or erase paint or <laughs> knock a coffee onto this and say, oh, that spilled coffee looks so cool. I'm keeping that. It doesn't happen when you're digitally painting. So digitally painting requires an immense amount of thinking. Just immense. And that's a good thing because when you're thinking, you are just doing exactly that. You're using your brain. And uh, that is very important because it will keep you from getting old, from aging. The more you use your brain, the more you're thinking, the more you're cognitively involved. Like I'm looking up, I'm looking down, I'm using my mind, my hand, my motor control. These things give you long life. You're not just sitting there staring at a TV set. You know, you are interacting with your whole being, body, mind, soul, hand, uh, motor controls, everything. that going. I think I'm going to have a division here. 
So you start to uh, just kind of gotta have some of these very subtle carapace intrusions. But, you know, like uh, scuffs and dents and little marks on uh, the shell, you know. So you might have to take uh, the flow up and then just make little touch little spots. See, like that. These are some pollens. Dusting. cracks and stuff. Dents, pollen, dirt. You know, it could be anything. For the most part, it's going to be pollen, and it's just going to be natural uh, part of living things that damage the creature. You know, just like you break your nail when you're doing your dishes or hammering or something. you got to have some of those uh, natural-looking imperfections and then it really gives credence to um, the reality that the, the, the aspect of nature to it the hyper reality you know that I'm, I'm into you know the high function of it all file save and now what we're going to do is we're going to just look at it, fit it on the screen for a minute. First, we got to see, see if you look up at the top of my screen above the ruler where it says flight of cicada in the flower, the name of the file, it says 167%. That's the magnification we're at. So if I go to my view window and I go zoom to fit, there you can see how nice it's starting to look. And if I go to 100%, since this is a 9 by 12 landscape, uh, we would view it 100. And then if you look at the ruler at the top, you see it goes 0 to 12 lengthwise and 0 to 9. And that is actual size. That really is the actual size on the monitor. So I can see my whole finished piece because I'm working on a 24 inch um, Wacom Cintiq digital monitor. And that allows me to look, as far as a 9 by 12, I can see the entire image like that was a canvas, you know, on that easel. And now we'll hit another song. We'll go to uh, this one. <laughs> and yeah, this is how I look at it. And it's, everything is looking really cool. You know, it's starting to have a... It's starting to work. And as I develop it, I'll ponder. But you see how the plates are flat going towards the tail. And then as you get closer to like the head between the wings there, like it's uh, uh, the back of like it's helmet, let's say, or thorax up there at the top, the neck part between the wing. Um, you can see it's got a little lift. And then you can see the two plates below there are starting to take form and shape. So I work slow. This is 100% enjoyment for me. Um, I don't make any money doing this. I do this uh, following Confucius. Confucius said, if you like what you do, you'll never work another day in your life. So I've been doing digital art, uh, teaching myself that for the last seven-ish years. And one day I just hope to somehow make money with it uh, in a no-pressure situation where uh, I continue to do just what I love here, and I get a check. So I haven't figured that out yet. But that'll happen. It will happen. You know, because everyone has to pay their rent. 
all right? So just like everyone else, I gotta pay rent. I gotta, you know, maintain my car. I gotta keep up my bicycle and everything like that. And to do that, you gotta have income. So among the other things I do, I would love this to switch over to an income stream someday. And it's just going uh, to spend years and years just developing all this. See how nice that kept the shine. I just, less pressure. And uh, we've got the hardness too hard. I'm going to take that down to zero again. But that worked for that situation. And then that's um, looking at my reference, you know, it's a little whiter the way that artist and the, you know, they retouch a photo, you find a photo on the internet, you can use that for reference. Um, and as you draw, as an artist, you know, you're digitally drawing, you can say, sometimes you say, well, heck, exact what I'm copying is digitally drawn in there because it doesn't connect the way you thought it would with the other stuff. When you start to develop your, the eye, the scrutiny of your eye, the way you scrutinize the art, you're looking at it to say, okay, I need a line here, this is a shadow, this is a highlight, I want it to be raised, the carapace, and so on. Your eye gets attuned to start to locate the digital painting of every photograph you see on the internet. They've all been retouched. I mean, there's places you buy one that's not retouched. But for the most part, everything you're looking at has been retouched to some degree. And you will start to develop a knowing of what's retouched uh, as you work. Because you'll say, oh yeah, that's... It, all of a sudden it does this, you'll say, for instance. You know, all of a sudden it did that. Why did it do that? And you're looking at it and you go, oh, because the person drew that in there. So, to create realism, to create, uh, you know, transparency, to create solid, to create glossiness, to create illumination, it really behooves you to copy. Start copying, start looking, start drawing yourself in the garden, you know, a sketchbook or something. But, you know, if you want to know what a clear bubble looks like, look it up, copy it. I'm telling you, just trace it, everything in there. If a guy has a little piece of green dot in the bottom that's reflecting something from a plant a mile away, whatever, just start copying it, and you'll begin to understand how glossy things work, how transparent things work, how shiny things work. And... Then, at the same time, you're also studying the color scheme, like, you know, something's in shadow, something's in light, something's in um, reflected light, the different things that, you think of a surface as just a surface, that's it. it, it think of it as it is a surface that is shaped in a certain shape. But how you see that surface depends on everything around it. The lighting, the, the um, uh, you know, what it's made out of. Uh, the wind. It could be anything, depending on what you're drawing. So you start to observe. You know, see how this is compared to what we first had when we when we got on here today, big difference, big difference. And I want to put a little illumination on it underneath so that it's, even though this is falling into shadow and starting to take shape as a uh, solid object, light could be on the other side, and that light would be underneath the object. Let me do a save here. And we go all the way down to the bloom layer this layer here, and let's just take and lighten up the tone a touch, and, and I'm just going to draw over the edge of my bug, 
I'm going to go over even brighter in here. And it's not showing because we drew over that layer. So we're going to go all the way up to the top and we're going to add a new layer. That's right. When we made the correction, we had to draw over our background. So you could find that and then draw over that layer. But instead, we'll just do this. So watch. Just lightening that up just a little like that. See? Now, if I want that texture in there, it doesn't bother me. I could say, yeah, or I could want to do it with the airbrush. But I'll leave some texture. Just you know, lightly texturize just around it, just a little bit, so that it kind of suggests flight, but also suggests some stroke on a canvas. It's kind of a nice, nice effect. I'm going to come even brighter as I get closer to the body. And I'm going to draw over that with the body. Just So now we're fitting this back into the painting. As you can see. And then we'll illuminate right around the edge. Because what's happening is the light is is on the other side of the of the bug. But if I want it to be uh, showing in the, over the bloom, the plants growing in the background, the you know that stuff, uh, you got to do that. You know you got to have a way of doing those things. So we do that. Mm -hmm. We'll kind of come down here and draw an edge but I'm coloring it just a touch like it's there's a name for insects where they uh, oh the word for when they reflect like uh, all the colors are being absorbed into their carapace except the color that's reflected back to you so it looks like they have a blue carapace or they have a black carapace or so on. And there's a name for that effect. And uh, I'm drawing that effect. <laughs> so you see this, my way of doing these stages, you know, everyone has their different ways of doing it. It's all, nothing's right or wrong. Or Sure. So file save. That's looking pretty nice. I'm going to do some more work on that. I'm going to take a brief break. I shall be right back. Let me uh, stop this for a minute. And we're back. Here we go. So yeah, I was just a uh, Checking the email, making sure, turn the lights on outside. It's getting dark a little bit. So, porch light, that stuff. Now, back to my art. Some pollen uh, specks here and there in the front. Gotta be, uh, take the hardness up so they start to show. It raises the surface a little bit and comes up, goes down, bends, insect style. Doing 
something to the bottom eye there, just a little bit. And uh, some things are off-white, some things are actually white. If you want, you know, got to think about what's what before you do it. Looking at the bottom eye, there's some ridges around that. This is minutia, yeah. Uh, it's the tiny details that really give credence, give believability to something. You know, it does take hours of work. That's the thing. So, it takes a certain dedication, I think, which I have. And uh, that's why I enjoy it, you know, to... Contrast is important between shapes and stuff. Don't forget that for detail, for shadow, to create dense, to create raised surfaces, lowered surfaces, back surfaces, surface, surface, surfaces. <laughs> All kinds of things, the way light hits it and so on. So file save. And let's view this now. Um, I'm going to go back down back up. So view at 100. And see the insects now starting to have believability in space. In uh, I like to have a sense of gravity, so by gravity not meaning morose gravity, but earthly gravity, like you want it to feel solid, weighted, like it's in space, or it's a solid object, or it's real. And gravity is hard to portray, but um, you will learn your own way to express gravity. And your eye, the more you draw, the greater your eye gets at seeing. Because an artist has to really see it. Like, I'll make it look better than the painting that I'm using, the reference and photo or whatever. I'll enhance it my way, take it to the next level. Each person's under their own budget restraint or time restraint or whatever when they make a photograph and then it goes to the guy that retouches it and so on and so on and so forth. So when you draw for yourself, you know, you put as much into it as you as you want. See, so a little bit of green down here. Uh, just there's a word for it, what they do, why uh, the skin of insects. Uh, how they illuminate. It's it's very, very cool. There's a lot going on in the in the skin of a a beetle or anything. Stag beetles and all that stuff, they're so cool. They have so much going on though. Just so much going on in the skin. The reflections and stuff. I'm going to go up a layer because I'm going to put some white on the edge here. And if I don't like it, I can come right back to this by just turning the layer off. So between the wing and the body, going to the outside of the body, just putting a little edge there. I'm going to come around into the wing with that light. Just a little bit and make it whiter. Like they're, it's on the other side, but it's somehow there's some reflection stuff going on in space and motion, and um, like capture a little bit of that we bouncing around light, the magic of light. Light is magical, and you can introduce that sense. surface of a thing is just infinitely complex when they're bugs. 
I mean, if, if you can understand a bug, you can make a robot. <laughs> For sure. Uh, it's so cool. They're just so cool. See how we're articulating the edge of this with color and form and shape and reflection and density and lack of density and focus and non-focus and stuff like that. As I go around, I'm working these things. I'm not just putting down black here or that there. There's a reason why I'm doing what I do. You know, each thing is purposeful. It's not mimicking. It's, uh, you know, I'll, I'll look at what's there and then I'll say, what is going on? Is it because it's in the dark? Is it because there's pollen? Is it because it's motion? Is it because it's this, that, the other thing? And so, you know, even if I want to duplicate something, I will touch my eyedropper tool, go back to the brush, touch the color, pick up the pigment, run the pigment in there to match. So remember, your, your eyedropper tool is like a clones of color for you. It puts it on your palette so you can use it again. Then if you can see interfere with some of this, brush some of that background in there, not so much yellow. Clean up the edge. Tidy it. Just tidy things a little bit sometimes. Helps. Yeah. And then they connect the dots, so to speak, here. Got to do stuff that really isn't a black. Like that edge up at the top I just put in. Or this wing passing in front of the other wing. Or there's so many ways stuff overlaps in a insect you could get lost really in a dragonfly wing or a, you know one of these wings for sure for sure Just a little bit of black there we go oh yeah I'm not done with the body then we'll do some airbrush parts over the wing, and then we'll get into the flower detailing. <sighs> See, I like the upper part of the body now. I've got kind of like a, a trace line that goes beyond the shell, but suggests the curvature of the shell, like it's in motion, made a move. Your eye captured certain parts, other parts are still moving. And instead of drawing everything in hyper focus, some things I have purposely unfocused, and other things I purposely put in focus. And then little lumina luminosities of stuff, uh, you know, highlighting the coloring of the carapace, reflected light, just little things here and there. You can do that too. It will, you know, a little purple or uh, little greens or blacks or something that makes it all believable. Instead of like sweepingly, you know, I changed the, the ridges on this I, uh, compared to my reference and stuff. So I'm doing whatever, you know, each bug is different. So I look at it and I. I, uh, putting my touch in. So up at the top here near the wing, I'm going to have some pollen fall over it all. Like you can see it as light. You can see it as pollen. You can see it however you want. Just the very top, like it brushed up against something. And then seeing how it's on the ridge, and it might be on a border, or a bump, like hit a high spot. 
It's a good thing I didn't have a digital when I was younger. Because <laughs> I think I would have been lost. I never would have. I would have been so wanting to do this that I never would have ever supported myself or my family. I think I would have just got enthralled by it all. I actually wrote some software when I was younger just in a basic language for the Atari to draw uh, one pixel at a time, collaborated with a guy, and we tried to market that but it didn't do much. We tried. It was very, very simple program. It was just like you just establish a grid, say 100 by 100 blocks, you know, pixels, and then you could color each individual pixel from a palette. It was very primitive, and it was way before there were things like Photoshop or anything like that. Just on the Atari, put it up into a toy store, you know, just crazy stuff I tried. Just crazy. So now we need some dark in here in the bottom. Pushed back so it has a true form. So each individual plate of armor, like, of the beetle. And you could do this, you know, for infinity, so you don't want to get lost too much. So that's, I'm calling that a save. And I'm going to view that at uh, fit on the screen. It's good. And now I'm going to soften up a little bit of the other wing on the bottom there. We're going to go a new layer. So if we don't like it, we haven't wrecked anything. I'm going to pick like a brownish, reddish brown, kind of a oxblood color, like an oxblood shoe, you know, that reddish brown. And I'm going to kind of, uh, like I did on the top one, I'm going to brush some of that in there, just myself, to uh, see that in the bottom wing there, like that. And then some up at the top here, just to our shade delicately enhance um, and create some depth uh, better so than you know my reference for sure this is this is looking pretty sweet compared to my reference this is and I'm digging this a lot mm -hmm. Then we're going to add some light behind this creature. So we're going to get back to the balloon. We're going to come down to the balloon. We're going to go up a layer above that. See, we're squeezed a layer in between the, if you look at the box on the left, the one that has mostly green and the one that has mostly red. Actually, it's going to be over the red one. we got to squeeze it in. So I'm going to take this, get rid of that one I just put in there, and I will move up above the red one and then I'm going to take a uh, just kind of a gray light I'm going to make a wide light beam and I'm going to come across from the left straight across the canvas on a diagonal it's just exaggerating it so you can see there how it goes behind everything now I'm going to take that out I'm going to go to the airbrush so what I use for airbrushes, I go to basic, and then I go down to all these fuzzy brushes here and just select one. I'll look up at the top, my opacity, I don't want it to be 100, I want it to be like 50-ish out of my flow for this light beam I'm going to take down, and I don't want any hardness. And then I'm going to airbrush one in there, like so. See that? And see how that fit right in under the wing and everything? And now I'm going to undo it because it's a little bit too intense. And I'm not going to press as hard. Now I'll do that a little bit lighter. So I'll come through like that. And now I'm going to go with some green. 
colors and some bloom over that. So I'm going to put the, just a little, see what I did there over the red? Just a little. It's a little too much. It brought the, the wing out too much. So we're going to edit, undo that. And we're going to take down the opacity even more and take the flow down a little bit. And we'll put that color in front a little, right there, under the, under the creature up at the top, under, under the leg and stuff. And then I'm going to go even a little bit darker, put some of that down here. And so now you can see a little bit of illumination. And then if I want that to go through the wings, so I'm going to have a, a couple specular kind of take this just kind of intense different tones see like some yellow some orangey shapes up there near the flower and then if I want to go over the wing with that. First, let me save this. File save. I'm going to create a new layer. I'm going to do a little bit over the top. Uh, just a little. See uh, as it gets down to the tip there? I'm kind of fading out the tip a little. So your eye is focusing on just so much that I'm taking out, fading back, and I will put some green in there. So you have the effect of seeing through the wing. And you can go even brighter. You know, you can do like, like that. So you have the tail, the, the, the bottom edge, create transparency. And then just a oh, little bit of where the top wing overlaps the bottom wing, like right in there. There's just a little fuzz there. And that looks really, really cool to me. And now I will put a little light along the top edge, just a little, like that. I will do a little bit in front on the edge, like that. Now it's starting to fit into the picture. We will put a touch um, just ooh, where the legs meet on the bottom there, like that. Where the legs meet at the top, because you know I don't want it all like. There you go, like that, a little bit of fuzz. And then at the top of the wing, the big wing, I'm going to come down over that, like, see the light up there at the top? Loving it, loving it. And then a little bit on this bottom wing, under the carrot, like, way up that little fuzz there. Ooh, ooh, just tasty. Tasty. And that's a save. I'm going to print this out as another frame before I start to work on the clover. So let me uh, show you how I do that. I do file, export. I take the pixels down so that it's not so much high res because it takes up all this space on my computer. And I export. And this would be frame number six. So I go to hit frame five. It gives me the name. And I change the last number in my numbering system to a six. And now I have this still saved. Now I'm going to post this and I will come back and work on the flower. Well, I'm back on Sunday. You can see from the time and date, it's 6-6, 2021 at 2-12 in the afternoon. And I'm going to work on the... Uh, 
I'm gonna work on the flower. So let's work on the flower. I'm going to, uh, what I did first initially was have it kind of in a soft focus as I worked out the grain and the texture and which brushes, gouache brushes and stuff I was gonna use digitally. So now I wanna sharpen focus a lot of this. Uh, even though I want my cicada itself to be in sharper focus as it's closer to our eye, I want the um, clover to have some nice edges and stuff and details. So let's begin that. We're going to go all the way up to the top of the layers. You can see there's a, just a gazillion layers here. doesn't matter how many you have. I do layer, 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 lots, layer, 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 because I keep it... Uh, non-destructive so I can manipulate. As you've watched in my previous videos, I show you the potent power of layers. Anybody that does digital art uh, understands that. And if they don't, you will learn to understand it because it's the, safe, it's the best way for you to be able to edit your work. And because uh, you're not going to remember what you did. And you have all these separate layers you can turn off and on and return to a point or go backward because these are like 30, 40, 50, 100 plates of glass on top of each other and you do a little bit of the painting on each layer of glass. And so if you needed to get behind and put color like behind the cicada and brush all around it and have a nice uniform look but not be on the cicada, that's why you want it on different layers. Same thing with the flower and so on. So let me, uh, let me start some detailed work. I'm going to start in the upper left and go towards the right all the way around. And we're going to work in the pick our brush. And for this I'm going to go into like a pencil. So I'm going to go uh, pencils. I'm going to try something like this. This is a uh, mechanical pencil HB. I'm going to pick a, uh, a white and let's start in the upper left and start detailing. So right now it's showing, I'm going to put a little more flow into there so I can see it. And take down the hardness a little, about 50. Take down the opacity a little, I don't want it solid. And then I'm going to put a stroke on there. So we're going to turn on the Express Key remote on our Wacom Cintiq 24 inch digital tablet. And in the upper left, right on top above the stem, is the first petal I'm working. See, on the left there. And this is where I put the highlight detail form the edges and give each petal its own distinct characteristics. It's going to take a little bit of time and that's what you're here for to really see what I do when I do it. Some lines to the back of the petal I go across the interior with a line here and crumple up a little something there. Bring that down into the like this and turn it into here and just add some frill like that. Add a little bit of solid white kind of in the back to bring these two lines together. front here like so and now I've got the start of that petal looking pretty good I'm going to put some yellow onto that petal in the front just a light dusting of yellow like that and I'm going to erase um, some stuff behind and to do that I'm going to take my arrow key and I'm going to touch a spot like there 
that tells me way down there it's on that layer. So here's where I'm going to erase from. And this is why I have layers. You see me taking that out behind. And I can erase around that one I just worked on. And it does not at all affect the integrity of that. Very, very cool. And I'll leave a little soft uh, thing behind there, like out of focus fuzz residual stuff, because it could be, you know, just a piece of soft, delicate material that's left. And you don't know why. And these do have uh, pinks in them, too. In fact, I'm going to... I think I'm going to completely get rid of it. Well, I like it. I like it. It adds depth. I'm going to change this opening a little bit on this, so we're going to go back up to the one I was working on. And we're going to maybe solidify an outside edge. So we'll go here, and we'll go here a little bit with yellow. Starting to solidify the outside. And bring some down near the stem. Brighter. And then erase it back a little. Just soften it at the top so that it kind of merges back. And we're going to add again some uh, petal shape to the front as I start to uh, build this. And that's just my cell phone and. Uh, I'm not going to stop and, and mess up what we got going here right now. So it's just going to ring. You will just hear it in the background. Uh, because I have a... Because I'm semi-retired, and I have a one-man uh, owner-operator tattoo shop on my property here um, that's been closed because of COVID. 19. Um, it's going to get reopened in the fall, and I'm still working on my new business plan and waiting for everyone to get their backs and all that. Um, people call, there's a message, tells you how to just sit tight. I'll be back, but not right now. And you know, 90% of the time when I was opened in this location for the last six years, 80% of the phone calls are fake calls. So they're not even worth answering ever. In fact, that now it's at the 90% level where it's just people from competitors or people sitting in a library that has nothing to do or just somebody that wants to bug you. They just call. They don't even have, you can tell. It's not an intelligent inquiry, and it's either um, a competitor harassing you, or... Uh, and there's a lot of that. There still is a lot of that. I never had that in Detroit, but uh, I've been in Washington 16 years, and there's a ton of uh, just generalized haters and people that just try and sabotage you. It's been going on since I... I've been here because I didn't grow up here. I'm not part of their network of people. So I can honestly say that's part of the Northwest way of thinking. If you're not part of the good old boy network or the modern good old boy network, <laughs> whatever they call themselves, you're just not going to be, you're just going to be harassed. That's, that's it in general. So I don't even answer. People ask me the most ridiculous stuff, and I used to, I'm so kind about it. I, used to, I offer free consultations and all that stuff. That stuff's all over now that the COVID thing happened. And I'm just talking a little bit about the biz here. Is that it? It really reaffirmed everything I thought, and actually got quite worse. So been a lot of people shifting around in the country and they come from other places and uh, it's a big military base here you know I live in the state capital so there's tons of government people 
uh, all from different walks of life, different states and stuff like that. And very tricky to do business in Olympia. The state itself has gone through immense changes, including uh, Olympia. And when I'm saying this stuff, it's not like I'm making it up. I mean, there's tons of businesses that have lawsuits against the city and stuff prior to COVID and during COVID. And, and I just stay out of it all. But I'll open when, uh, when in the fall for sure, because I just have to. And it's, you know, I like doing it. It's just that uh, a lot of a lot of militant type people that have these attitudes. That I'm not sure if that's ever going to change now that that's been provoked, you know? So there we go. A little bit of information. Okay, now that one's looking pretty good. The inside is, is awful dark. I don't want it to be that dark. So I'm going to come back in there with some white and bring it up. But... Um, that's uh, it's interesting there. Bring it down from the top. I tell you, these things do their own kind of stuff too. So a lot of times you got to go up another layer and another layer and another layer and figure out what's going on up there. See, as long as you're patient, you will get it. Now. You can always clean up the edge of stuff, just go around it, your eraser. And if you really want to get into it, you can uh, darken. Let's, let's say I want to go back to the background, all the way down here where you see that little uh, second layer up on the left where all that, those shades of green are in that box. That's the background layer. If I hit that and say I wanted uh, to change the contrast between the flower and the background, wanted to introduce a tone, say like even a blue behind there, I could do that like this. There's some black and I could, um, that was erasing, or I could take the brush, now watch, and just delicate, see that light blue light I just put in there? Some bloom, as it's called. You know, just do background out of focus thing. You can do that. If you didn't like the color, you can erase it, or you can go over it with another shade and build up some type of plant life, you know, that's background back in there or um, completely erase like this just and have dark so it's up to you and I think we're gonna go with uh, some like an army green so I'm gonna rotate my uh, triangle I'm gonna get into a green brown Maybe like something like that, and introduce that. So I'll go just kind of coming across there. Like there's some dark foliage behind it, and that kind of brings that out and looks interesting. So I'll do file save for now. And if I look, no one's left me a voice message. And in part of my message, it says uh, exactly what I said to you guys. But if you really uh, need to get a hold of me or a friend or something or one of my vendors or something like that to leave me a message. And when I don't get a message, it's pretty clear that uh, it's just someone thinking around because... Uh, if you really want something, you'll tell me.
you know, being older, I'm going to date myself, but when we called up a company or something, uh, you know, I was a salesman for years. I did all kinds of things, but when I call up somebody, I introduce myself. I say, hello, this is Dave Herman. Uh, I have an inquiry. I was wondering if blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, what are your hours and this and that. But people just don't do it anymore. They, they'll they call up and they'll go, how much is a nickel? <laughs> like, uh, you know, that's supposed to make sense to me. Color, black and white, how big, back of your neck, uh, cover your whole back, right on your finger, what? You know, just, how much is a nickel? How much is a butterfly? Not, hi, how are you? I have an inquiry. May I ask you a question? <laughs> Just bizarre. The world has changed so much. And that's the mindset that they seems to be being fostered in the world today is the crudeness, the rudeness, the out and out, um, just crass nature of education. It's not what it used to be. Very little respect for the other person. It's all about the person that's uh, got their issues. You know, like you're, everybody you talk to, you got to be a shrink. <laughs> it's like no, it's not how it works, man. It's a business. If you want shoes, ask me. Tell me the kind of shoe you want sweater, whatever it is. <laughs> Everyone thinks they're tough, too. That's another thing. I grew up in the city uh, in the suburbs of Detroit, and uh, it's almost like growing up in a third world country when I grew up there. So, these people just have no concept of anything anymore disheartening because America is America, you know, it's like awesome. It's got four seasons going all the time, it's got places you can travel all the time, it's got really good people that want to be good people all the time. It's the bad apples that mess it up, you know, the ones that just have to like sort of walk out into the traffic of your mind. You're sailing along in your brain, you got some like, happy thoughts going, and then some guy just jumps into the traffic of your mind. <laughs> it's one way of thinking about it, that's for sure. And then we got this stuff going on here, and it doesn't quite make sense to me. So I want to uh, want to narrow something here. I've got to find that later. I'm going to go. Tap outside the box of art, tap in this color there, and that's saying that's the layer I gotta be on. So, that being the case, oh, got it undo. What did I hit? Oh, it should be on the brush. There we go. That's it. I wanna narrow this down around this petal. So, first thing I'm gonna do is put some bloom into there. It's not shading, it's going to be just, a, um, right now I'm changing the taper of my stem. And I'm going to join this stuff together below. Cluster. That really... Get that separate from that. Then we're up or left, and we're going to walk, work our way around. And it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge. I'm changing some stuff that I hadn't originally intended to, but now that I'm fine-tuned, that's what happens. So we'll keep on going down, because I'm going to put bloom over that. All right. And I'm going to wind it down here even more inside, just a little, 
to build out. We'll, we'll figure out as we go along. So I want to take some of that yellow and that part out. So if I click here and then go to erase, see at the top I'm erasing. Then another layer. We're just redoing the skin. You can do that because you did it on layers. And it's finding the right layers um, stuff. Mm -hmm. And save and then come in with the bright color again. So a bright line with yellow. So I'm going to move this a little here. Color. A little greener right there. And I'm going to bring that down from the top. Uh, say here, and come down, yep. add in texture, highlight, yeah, like that. some darker shades to get these greens a little more uniform. And some of that going on. And then the background like uh, some more bloom which I will uh, I'm going to put some blue in there. I, do, I want some blue in there. So to do that we're going to go all the way down to the bloom layer above it and just kind of put some light around here. Like that. A little bit of texture to it too. Doesn't bother me. I'm brighten it up in that corner. Bring it down like there's some flower stuff going in there. Run the eraser over it. I can almost feel this is like a chalk, like a dry coffee crayon. I can almost smell it when I paint like I was, you know, every everything has a scent like to me. If I rub oil paint or an acrylic or something, I can smell that, you know, and because I did it for so long as an artist in the traditional world, before ever getting into digital art, it's almost like my mind still smells the chalk dust, you know, that you put into the air. It's just, tch. yeah, it's weird. It's very weird. And I wonder if other artists experience that. So I'll put some white beam in here. That is interesting, but that's not what I want. I want uh, an airbrush beam. So I'm going to get out of that special pencil and I'm going to go to basic and I'm going to go down to the bottom and I'm going to go to that. And now I'm going to put my beam in where it's softer. Like that. See? Because I didn't want those chunky looks. That chunky look is cool for something else, but not for what we were doing. And then maybe some nice color there, some flower reminder. And uh, so that brings out the little uh, edges that are kind of breaking there, which is kind of cool, but not so much. So we're going gonna to go back all the way up to the top and paint over that with the airbrush brush what I call my airbrush brush like that some sunlight in there too far 
It's all too heavy, actually, but it's the right idea. So we're going to take those out. Not a problem. This is what I mean by non-destructive. And change the value system here. So 100% is too high. I didn't notice that I did that in there. And uh, now I can draw that back in there. Like so. a little at a time to cover. Yep. Oh. Raise the flow. Type of look. It's cool. That stem's a little bit thick, so we'll take and erase some of that. Hopefully, we can do that just right. Got a nice little torque. Kind of flattens out where I don't want it to flatten out, so we're going to change that. We're going to come in a little bit crossover to here. In, this, in the bend, we're going to cross over like that. Oops, I want it up here. So there we go. Looking at that for a minute, it's a little too far. So just so you know, I, I'll redo things just a hundred times until I get it the way I like it. But just that way. Just from just that way. Stuff is tricky. This stuff is tricky. And I might even just, I'm going to do a dark band just to see what happens when I come into that. There's a cover for the white edge. There we go. so hard to hold your hand steady to do this stuff sometimes. Like that. Yeah. It's not smooth enough, so we're going to edit that out. And we're going to try it again. I've got this on an acute angle right now on my board. So it's an eye-hand coordination thing there, the movement. I know this isn't going as fast as you'd like it, but it's just the way I'm, I'm dawdling and thinking, sorry. But oh, undo, undo, undo. Too much flow.
everything's tricky. Very, very tricky. I'm going to go way up. that to be behind now let me see if I can get down to the bloom and do some down there and see if it works I'm not drawing on the stem see it's that and I want to draw on the stem <sighs> up at the top come down with a layer of that color over the brown Up again, another layer. It's not letting me hit it. I gotta find the brown. <laughs> this is what happens when I do too many layers. Right there, should be able to go right now. There we go. That's why you have all these layers to do all this cool stuff. You know these effects. If you're an effect guy like I am, I like to have my own uniqueness and yeah, I'm not sure about it all the time so I get there it's not like I have a canned way I do stuff I'm trying to get a nice magical feel at the same time and uh, this is worth it but it takes time to get there see so you're you're a witness to what I'm doing You're looking at this now the way the insect looks at it. Not the way human looks at it. Human. Human. Don't bug me, human. You're looking at it the way the insect sees it. A lot of stuff going on. A lot of changes and in integrity, value, and things of my own doing. A kind of magical stage, so file save. Okay. Okay, Tony, let me take a sip of water. So I have the combination of the way the insect would see it and the way you would see it which calls for some more music, something relaxing. Before I lose my mind trying to do this stuff. Oh, it's thinking, thinking, thinking. Let's go up a layer. So everything I do from now on starts fresh. Oh, this is too much crazy. warmer areas and cooler areas and stuff like that and so you gotta introduce that stuff yourself very mystical how this stuff uh, it's making it so I have to do things I don't want to there we go yeah warming that up a little bit And there's little, um, say, yeah. things on a very tiny level I gotta introduce to make this work. Very tiny little nuances of shading and value changing and things behind, things in front all that good stuff, you know.
Not sure if you can hear the brush just scraping. Uh, it sounds like a, you know, just a, a movement across the glass. It's a, it's a matte screen, just an incredible screen. There's nothing like it on the uh, Wacom Intuos or Wacom Cintiq 24-inch Pro monitor. Um, that matte screen is just an incredible surface. You feel like you're working on a substrate, whether you're working on canvas or MDF board or masonite or something. It just has that feel of your, there's a, a drag, like a slight, you know, textural connection to your art in the real, like you have in the real world when you're, uh, working on canvas or something, you know, that can feel the brush making contact with the canvas. That's what this feels like. It's really, really, really good. I love the uh, Cintiq. It took them a while to figure this out, let me tell you. So many generations. They got it good the last time. I have a 24 inch. Uh, I certainly wish I had the 30. I would do live figurative drawing, I think. Uh, just have a model in the room once COVID's over and just uh, draw direct to a 30 inch, but they're pretty pricey. If I had income, I would do it, but not until I figure out a way to cash flow me again. So, we'll get there. It's all a matter of time. You put your priorities where you put them. And for me, during COVID, it was to increase all my skills as an artist and to finally just take my mind off the world, which was hard because of the politics, but, um, you know, I've come to enjoy working out more again, no more gyms, I work out at my house, I bicycle, I do free weights at my house and my garage, and I do stretching with some stretchy cables and stuff like that at my house and not the gym. Um, I find working back in the house again, like when I was younger, in a really busy schedule where I couldn't be a member of a gym, um, is what I like more. The gym is just a place where everyone's, you, gotta, you can't talk to them because if you walk up to somebody, they think you're, you're strange now. Used to be gyms were great. You know, you could go in and everybody was happy to talk to each other and this, it may still be that way in Michigan, where I'm from, but as far as this northwest area, forget that, unless you're part of a, a group, military or government, you're just an outsider. It's clear, like they make it clear to you. And that's too bad because they miss out on cultural things that are very cool and things people have to share. Unless you're, you know, part of the clan or, and I don't mean the, the clan clan, part of their group, they're clanish. They're very protective of whatever it is. If you got secrets, you like that, you know. That's my feeling. If you're open-minded, you're open-minded. Yeah, I say strange stuff because you're visiting me in my studio. You don't have to visit me, you know? <laughs> uh, you don't, do you? But you chose to. And you may come to like that stuff because you got nobody to talk to now that's going to be honest with you. I'm the kind of guy, if you're from out of town, and you just wanted to have a sit-down talking session with, this was the place to go. But now, people just want to diss you because they are all keyboard warriors. They can just go on a computer and be nasty and nobody can find them and all that stuff. Just cowardly acts, if you ask me. And destroying the experience for people of a, a wonderful medium. The computer 
for me, I've learned so much stuff during COVID and just in general because I do research. I've actually connected with some people way up in different circles of research, science, art. I'm not kidding. Uh, professors, scientists, engineers, because of my diverse interests. And for me, the computer is a very powerful research tool. Like 10 different libraries all in one, the way I use it. But it's the naysayers and the people that, you know, just want to diss out science and art and culture, the, the you know, the no culture people. Uh, it's too bad. It really is too bad because uh, that's why you're alone at the end of the day and there's nothing going on for you. Because you help create that space. Whereas if you've ever done anything like travel or camp, or you've been to Burning Man, or you've been to foreign countries, or not just to go to Starbucks, but to go out in the jungle, or to go off the beaten path, or to go out and surf, or snorkel, or whatever. You start to learn that people around the world are a lot of fun. But if you stay in your neighborhood, you know, lately America's gone bananas. So... Big change is coming. Apparently, nature decided we need it. And I'm going with nature. If it means everybody gets dumped into the ocean and it starts over, I'm 100% with it. If it means man is erased as a species, I am 100% with it. Just make the next phase even better. That's all I ask for Mother Nature. For the creator, for the makers of us, the entities, that, that other civilization that's just in our field of vision and we never can see it. Where are those guys that keep building these giant things? Oh, the tools it took to do the things that we see. It's, it's evident to anybody with any kind of an engineering background or computer background, artistic background, we see that they had tools that are just unfathomable to us. They leave tool marks, they move massive stuff. I can never stop talking about ancient archaeology because to me it is fascinating. And you're watching me work, which Sometimes I go. I have to go off topic like that so I can focus on my art because my brain can work on something it's, it knows about while well, it's exploring another thing like it is right now. I develop these edges and petals and flowers. Sharp focusing stuff is really a trick. It's a lot of delicate work going around the borders very tightly. Subtle shades of color, subtle brush sizes. And then all of a sudden something comes into focus. A lot of times when I was younger, I'd be out fishing or hanging out with some guys at a lake, and then I'm supposed to be back in town because I had a date to go on or something like, uh, you know, it's time to hook up with somebody. 
And my friends would get me so hammered, you know, talking about your date and everything, that by the time I got there, I was just obliterated when I was young, when I was a young guy. And I worked, you know, 70, 80 hours a week. So partying was very important whenever you could get to it. Very rare. But unfortunately, I uh, showed up a little bit obliterated too many times. Never got in trouble, never did anything stupid, but just, I was thinking of that now because it's raining outside, I'm drawing, I'm listening to music, I'm a little bit nostalgic, especially on moody days, you know, kind of a romantic as an artist and as a designer and stuff. I always want to do things that can be either uh, mechanically sound, stuff for cars, or stuff that's very soft-edged, sensuous type stuff, like this. And um, you develop a strange brain over time. You just, you know, you can focus on so many things. Well, let's hit another track. Just to have a little music going in the background again. So I work on this flower. A bunch of gibberish coming out of my mouth today. Gibberish! You know, I could interview myself. <laughs> well, what do you think, guys? I do. I do think. Are you sure? Can you make money off of that? Not particularly. You think it'll ever replace Bitcoin in your brain? No. Do you think you can go into outer space with that? Maybe. Vagaries. I kind of like the vagary feel of this. I don't want to like destroy that. But there's things that got to be in focus and things that don't have to be in focus. When you got to change the brush size, you got to change the pressure size, you got to change the color. Every stroke is so much thought. And there's no like accidental blurring or accidental sharpening or accidentally spilling like you did when you did traditional art. So everything is a thought process. It really is. You're, before you make a stroke, you're thinking about your pressure, your density, your color, your the texture of the brush, all that stuff. And it's till it becomes reflex, which sometimes it doesn't and sometimes it really just flows. You're just like touching things and moving around. You're in the zone. You're not even thinking. Um, that state's always desirable to be just in the zone, as we say. Zoning out. Apocalypto. Save this and let's take a look at it. Uh, actual fit on the screen. I zoom to fit. That looks better. The flower definitely looks better. See, if you look at the bottom and you look at the top, you can see I've just started to individually focus petals in the cluster. Change the stem radically. Got a lot of stuff going on. We're going to do more to this stem uh, at the end but uh, got that flow going got the light going interesting because the flower itself and excuse my yawning uh, is going to be like a luminescent alluring attractor to the insect you know it's in the ultraviolet spectrum infrared spectrum it's saying Come take my pollen. Take me. Take me. Really. Take me. And so the 
cicada or whatever is supposed to get in there and walk around. They can't resist. They can't resist. And that's like us, you know? We see something we want, we can't resist. We gotta do it. It's just nature. But we have a little more rational mind. We're not so much uh, part of the machinery, I don't think. Like an insect and a flower, they're doing what they've done for billions of years. We are just... Uh, we are just taking it all in and sometimes we touch them, sometimes we eat it, sometimes we get poisoned by it, sometimes we get stung by it, sometimes we die by it because it's all experimental to us where they're kind of reliving generations and generations of their purpose on earth of uh, pollinating a certain plant. Um, evolving to pollinate that plant even better. <laughs> that kind of stuff. They're just doing stuff that is same old, same old, a little bit better, maybe. But they're born to pollinate something every season. They're born to hunt something, take it off the earth every season if there's too many of a certain thing. They're born to repeat you know and uh, repeat they do <laughs> introducing a little more of the magic of the insect way it sees it as I make it up of course we have no idea but I think so me, come see me, said the flower. I am attracted to you. I need you. Come touch me. And take part of me. And deliver it to another. So that I may grow. And pollinate. And reproduce. And make more of me. I can't get to the flower three orchards over. You must touch my pollen and take it there. Once you get it, I will teleport you mentally to the next mission, says the plant. You think you're in control, bug, but you're not. You're a bug. I'm a flower. I'm higher in the chain. And uh, even though I can't fly or walk, I am mind control for you. I will get my will done. And so it is with flowers and plants. So it is. They say, I need to reproduce. I need my genes to go on and make the best clovers, the best clover for the honeybee. I want to produce the most important ingredient, the best I can. I need messengers in my army to deliver my goods in the supply chain of nature. So, lo and behold, if you think you're under mind control, don't be an insect. Because they don't know whether they're coming or going. And verifiable proof of that is watch the predators of insects, you know, how they eat each other. Like a praying mantis could be sitting right in the middle of this, a little miniature one. The, the bug never sees the predator. Never. They never see each other. It could be a spider right next to it. It never sees it, which mystifies me because they're all in that infrared ultraviolet spectrum yet they don't see each other because it's another control of nature the population of things and the nutrients of things needed for things to eat and so they see the plant they do not see each other and that tells me 
that even we as human beings can be walking around surrounded by some other entity that we just we have no clue it's there it's in the room it's looking at us or whatever it's totally mind I don't know but we are clueless just like the insect because nature's doing something it's fulfilling its own purpose that it's greater than this you know the sum of the total of the parts is greater than the, the total of the whole I don't know how that saying goes but the total of the, total of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So there's something additional in the sum total of the whole of everything that is another added feature that's greater than if you just put all the parts together. Yes, the sum total is greater than the whole of the parts or whatever. Slightly out of focus, slightly attractive. File save. <laughs> Looking cool. I'm going to pause for a second just to drain my brain. Just uh, give it a res break. All right, time is ticking away. Uh, this is not going to go more than a half hour to be finished. Because it's already gonna, it'll it'll turn into a three-hour-long video and take like two days for it to process and upload. <laughs> but okay, let's finish this up. I gotta speed it up now. So I will select the tune and get back at it. Uh, let's try this one. And let's. Get rid of these outlines and things like that going around this flower and focus it up. So, chop chop. Here we go. Where's the eyedropper? Touch this green. See that green up there? Great. Now, go to brush and go around the border. Tidy it. See if we can do that. You gotta get that green. And it needs to have some hardness. So go up there. I think it should start to cover. It's not. So we're gonna find that brown. And then we're going to paint. There we go. Mystifies me sometimes how this layer system will mess with your brain. But first we're going to get the brown out, and then we're going to go lighter over it. Just kind of bring this out a little bit. I don't like that there. Those last two strokes, I don't like them out. In fact, the last four. Okay, there we go. Uh, a little darker up there, maybe. Introduce the dark. Just to feather out the edge. like that. It's interesting. There's got to be something to do with the, uh, let's get into this fuchsia. 
dark a little bit on this side. Too much. Keep the hardness down. Oop, no hard lines. So again, open and just touch. There you go, in between on the darks. Because the clover itself, it has that shade in it. And if you can integrate a little bit to that, it draws your eye to the flower, like the insect. And let's get back to fine tuning these petals, wrap this up. So I'm horsing around now. I'm, I'm, I'm telling myself, get it together, get this job done. I think you need more work. Just like you were paying, paid to do this. Get it done. So now we're wrap it up. You have to watch me go around, tidy it, and close it. Reach closure. Got some exotic music playing in the background from uh, Radio F uh, Royalty Free Channel. Let that play. It's, it's bensound.com, by the way. Yeah, I want to get divide up some of these petals and sharpen things. Just some tidy and keeping it painterly, keeping it realistic but painterly. In other words, I want it to look like brush stroke still. I want it to look like it was analog painted but done digitally. So, in other words, I did it digitally, but it has the appearance of being painted with real paint. That's, that's tricky. It's tricky stuff. And I want to keep my own style, you know. I want to keep my own way of doing it without being gaudy, without uh, being too detailed, not enough detail, all that good stuff. There's just a ton of things to think about when you paint, especially tonal values and breaking the rules and just how you're going to break the rules as a painter. You gotta break the rules. You wanna look different than others. <laughs> Make your own rules. Set the mood. Yep, it's starting to look cool. And define. The borders of things, the edges of things, a little bit separation of petals that are lost and overlap. You could do some of that, you know, like that. Can't have too much color in a flower, that's for sure. Well, I suppose you can do too much of everything, but <laughs> it's pretty hard just to mess it up. See, I'm changing the direction of some things. Late night, I've been watching some movies on the Turner Network, Turner Channel. Some of those old crime movies and dramas, and boy, the way movies were made back in those days without special effects and 100% dialogue and uh, drama and actors that really cried and smoked a cigarette and uh, just acted out. They did not say, you know, don't hate me. They just, they acted and they um, were like impulsive and uh, faced the consequences. <laughs> it was a very different world. Man, was it different. And the prejudices and uh, 
way they viewed uh, women or ethnic stuff or political stuff, just so different. It's good to see that because that's actually what laid the foundation, the groundwork for the world we're, we're in today. And certain things are valid, certain things aren't. And it's just cool. It's like a history when you can watch old movies juxtaposed against what people watch today, just scene changing, flickering like a strobe light or something. Before any dialogue, before you can focus your mind on the story, before you can uh, do anything, it's just action, action, action. And I think that's that's great if you're young and you're a video game person, but if you want a story, like you're reading a book or something, the old movies still are still way better to me. Of course, I'm dating myself. I like a story. I like character development. I like uh, pursuit of the truth, too. Something starts out kind of vague. You don't know what it is. You form the wrong opinion. Then you find out what it is. True story is happening. And that's like being a detective, a real detective, not a detective that forces the outcome, but a detective that's bearing down on the truth to find what really happened and not invent what really happened and just pin it on somebody. In those old movies, they get down and they say, aha, it's that guy, he's been around doing that forever, go get him. So very cool. And I'm st just about done with this, I think. My integrity, a little bit, a little dent here and there. And some stuff. digging it though. I'm digging what I've unleashed and teaching myself and introducing things to myself. Like Eddie, as I color this, I'm still trying to have this look like maybe the way the insect sees it and not just the way we see it. So it's the story of the cicada just come out from underground, climbed out of its carapace, it's a, a, what do you call it, chrysalis, you know, that is where it's living till it pops out as a, as a adult to net space. And there can be even decayed petals, you know, you can have the petals that are damaged. You don't have to be shy about that. You can tear one, you can, you can do that kind of stuff, you can fray them. Just about done. A little cornucopia of light and allurement. File save. Okay. Let's, uh, that's pretty cool. Let's uh, view the whole image. And then now take the sharpened brush. And I'm going to sharpen some areas. And I may dull some areas. So see if on the, low, on the left, see that triangle down the side, right above the eyedropper. You hit the triangle, it says sharpen brush. We click it. And the greatest sharpening will be in the center, lower area. So I'm going to pass that over it. Just a little bit more. Bring that in focus in a little. See? Looks good. And then take the dull brush above the eyedropper, which says blur. Let me just make sure that 
blur. Yeah. And I'm going to soften some stuff. See how big this is? That's too big. Take it down and just uh, soften a little bit on the edge. Don't want it too crispy. You know, too outlining. Just crispy. Like that. And maybe sharpen some at the top. We'll just look at their petal edges. Very much the tip. Just the tip. Your eye will do the rest. I'll save. Yep, and the tip on the left there. So I can work the very points. And then your mind makes it work, see? That's the advantage of that, because it's a calibrated brush. We've got it set at 100, 180. You can see up there. You can change that for your personal preference. Save. Uh, anything I want to dull on the wings or something like that. I could dull a little bit of the one, just a little bit at the where they meet on the inside, like right there. The lower wing where it is right below the bent one above it. So I'll just soften some of that back. This is the power of the blur. So using your software uh, to do some stuff. So where else the blur might be just a little bit on that carapace at the top of the bug. Like, uh, man, I'm not going to mess with that. I like it. I'm going to say this is it. I'm going to sign this. And that should be it. So let me uh, put a new layer up and get a good black and get the right brush, which is going to be basics and the solid. So we'll go up to there where these are like solids. And then I'm going to sign my name in the lower left corner. Just go for it. Let's see how thick this line is. It's got to be in a brush. Got to pick a color. Okay. Try it. Nope. Got to be at uh, there and change the width of the brush. And say about so. Take that last line out. Just make that smaller on the Z. And then I'm going to keep his signature soft. So I'm going to go uh, 66 2021. So 6 6 20 21. Let's zoom in on that and tweak it a little bit. So, back to brush and very much tidy these numbers up a little bit there. Six. Okay. Six. with it. It's okay if I have this the way on each one I do different and I like to play with it. So I'm playing a little bit because then it's my way of doing it. I know I did it. It's my sig. Or it ain't my sig. Each time I do something different.
file save. Let's see here. File save. View fit on screen. And view actual. It's at a hundred. Looks pretty good. I'm gonna sharpen that signature just a touch. So I'll put the sharpen brush over it. I like it. That is a winner. So now we're going to output the JPEG export. And we're going to export that at high res. Well, let's see. That, what am I doing? Export. My brain's not thinking. Hey, Dave. Export. Change that to a thousand right now. I have the master, you know. I may sell it one day. Okay, export. And this is what? Number eight. And there we go. Thanks for tuning in, everybody.